Have you noticed in our, our existence as we age that our injuries tend to change as we move into the upper echelons of our physical either development or digression, depending on how you view that? In fact, one of the things I have noticed is I'm actually more embarrassed and hurt by telling someone how I got injured than the actual pain from the injury itself. And uh, my boys, uh, they talk about me who lived back in the 1900s, speaking of the Stone Ages, like it's some ancient form of civilization that we need archaeologists to come in and study or reveal to us. But uh, somebody contrasted the injuries of being a child versus the cause of injuries as an adult. Uh, childhood injuries would be things like, you know, you fall off your bike, you fall out of a tree, those kind of entry-level things that we all navigate. Here are a few sources of adult injuries, all right? And sorry to bring up some trauma if this evokes this in your heart today. First one that caused an adult injury, I slept wrong. That's all it took. And maybe last Sunday with the time change, you especially experienced that. You're still recovering. Uh, the second one is equally dangerous. I sat down for just too long. I just, I, I got there and then, and then tried to get back out of the chair. And then this is my favorite one. I just sneezed too hard and threw my back out, okay? And so, uh, isn't it interesting as we move through life that often the wounds, the challenges, the burdens of life have really less to do with the externals in all seriousness today have much more to do with the soul the mind, the heart. We're going to talk about today how anxiety both challenges us, but also through the provision of Jesus and the gospel, we have what we need to navigate it in a way that pleases and honors the Lord. Now, the verse that your pastor just read in verse number six, the little word careful that's found there in our translation has the idea of anxiety. Being anxious for nothing is the command that God gives us through the Apostle Paul. It also means to be troubled with cares. It also means to be divided. And often our minds and hearts are divided in their focus, in their priorities, in their pursuits because of this anxiety that nips at our, our heels, if you will, that often distracts us from everything that God wants. So the question today is, I want you to think about this because we talk about the gospel a lot, right? And I mean, to start a service with a baptism like that, I mean, there's nowhere but, I mean, just that just, that was awesome to see and hear. But how do we let the gospel practically into our anxious hearts? How do we let him into our anxious, how do we let it into our anxious lives? How do we do that in a practical way? Well, here in the text today, we find two steps or two antidotes in the gospel that specifically are provided by God himself. Think about this for us to deal with the fear and anxiety in our hearts. Well, so let's spend our time today talking about these two hope-filled antidotes. Number one, let's talk for a few minutes about the anatomy or the profile of human anxiety. I found as a counselor, as a pastor, as just a fellow believer that often I use a term and I mean something different from it than maybe you do or vice versa. And so let's be careful to understand what anxiety is. The challenge with anxiety, to be honest with you, is that it is largely a symptom-based diagnosis. And so there's a lot of subjectivity that comes into how we view anxiety, how we process it, and how we seek to resolve it. Um, and so we need the Lord's help to understand it accurately through the lens of Scripture. So let's talk first of all about the human experience. What is it like to be anxious? For some of you, you could stand and testify for hours what anxiety feels like. For others in the room, it may be a foreign subject. It may be something that's more academic or abstract. And so let's, for just a moment, to help us have greater empathy and understanding for others in the room and watching today that this experience is a challenge, to say the least. The first thing that's a part of the human experience of anxiety is we feel very personally vulnerable. We feel vulnerable to threats. We feel vulnerable to risk that are around us. Some of the anxiety disorders would include um, uh, generalized anxiety disorder, panic disorder, society, uh, social anxiety disorder, and various other phobia-related anxieties. Some of you may have social anxiety, and being in this room today and processing that is a daily battle, an ongoing thing for you. The two main parts I want to just spend a moment on before we get to the practical steps in our text today is there's, first of all, some psychological things that often feed or sustain our anxiety that we need to understand and appreciate and be able to head off with the Lord's help. The best way I've heard it would be this. It's almost like if you can visualize train tracks, anxiety is the mind off the rails. 
It just wants to go. Have you ever felt where your mind wants to go in three directions at once or 30 directions at once, trying to triangulate against certain uh, risk and threats? Um, And so the idea with the mind psychologically is the mind is racing. Anxiety is consumed with the what ifs of life. What if this happens? And then what if this happens? And the mind is fragmented or divided, as we mentioned a moment ago, We must appreciate that. The idea would be this. Anxiety is trying to maintain control in a self-protective, self-sufficient way. You do know that that is the opposite of the gospel, right? We don't save ourselves. We don't um, merit or protect our salvation on our own. We must rest in what God has done. So the psychological. Secondly, the biological would involve where the body and the soul overlap. Have you noticed that sometimes the interaction between our inner self and our body, it's hard to ascertain which it is. Is this spiritual? Is this physical? Often where those two meet is often where anxiety rules in our lives. Um, And so we have to remain sensitive to the physical and the organic issues. There are times where there is something physiologically or organically going on that needs to be addressed that's feeding and sustaining the anxiety that we navigate. Now, can I just say this before we get to the other side of this issue? Um, Have you noticed that our young people are deconverting at alarming rates, especially when they get out of high school? I was in this room with your middle school and high school students just on Friday. Have you noticed they're leaving the faith? They're abandoning the things that we have often taught them and instructed them in. Can I encourage you that a lot of that is the result of us not speaking to the whole person with the gospel of Jesus Christ? See, the gospel doesn't just impact our soul or our spirit. It's, it's meant and intended by God to impact all of us. We're about to celebrate Easter. If God has conquered the grave, that means also we physically one day will be free of not just anxiety, but every malady of the body and the mind and the heart that's a part of this brokenness that we're still in this already but not yet state. We're already in Christ, but we've yet to fully be redeemed from it. And so we have to understand that, we have to speak to that, and do so with compassion and conviction for the next generation. So there's personal vulnerability. Secondly, this is key as well, there's also personal responsibility. Um, It's interesting in the book of Philippians, we don't have time to break it down, but in specifically chapter 4, the chapter is saturated with commands. Did you notice verse 6 that we just read? Paul says to these Philippians and to us today, be careful, be anxious for nothing. So we are responsible to do right with the anxiety that often plagues us in the present tense. Um, Your pastor and the staff here are trying to get me to decide, do I prefer donuts from Maynard's um, or do I prefer donuts from Milton Bakery? I've had the Maynard's. They've got some set aside for me for Milton Bakery, so I will try to be diplomatic and not answer which I prefer not to create a church split today, but um, I was thinking back, your pastor and I, as he mentioned, we went to college together. Have you noticed that co- my son's a freshman this year? Have you noticed that college young men tend to not have the best diet during that phase of their lives? Um, when I think of those years, I think of Pop-Tarts, I think of ramen noodles, I think of all these things that I'm now trying to recover from and make certain tweaks to bounce back from. But one of the things we drank regularly that just makes me like, like my mouth puckers up and kind of cringes when I think of it, is an orange substance called Sunny D. Do you know what this is? And um, a very very nutrient-laden substance. Yeah, right. And uh, somebody, this is the best definition I've ever heard of Sunny D that I have not drank since I was in college. Sunny D tastes like someone made a bet that they can make orange juice without using orange juice. (laughs) Right? Can I say to you, as it relates to navigating anxiety or any of these areas of of unwellness in our lives, that we must have the key ingredient of personal responsibility. See, what the gospel does, yes, it puts the onus on God to free us from our sin and its consequences, but now we're to walk in it, right? We're to live in light of the truths and the, the glorious grace that God has provided for us. Um, as it relates to anxiety, one of, the, one of the most frequent profiles of it is what is called a panic attack. How many of you at least have heard of it, maybe experienced a panic attack? Many of you have experienced this. Um, panic attacks can have all kinds of sensations associated with them, heart palpitations, sweating, trembling, shortness of breath, feeling like you're being smothered. 
um, derealization, uh, all kinds of, of symptoms that are part of, of a panic attack. But here's the challenge with that term. It sounds like a panic attack just out of nowhere sneaks up and pounces on you. When in reality, what I have found often with the counselee that I work with, as I do so regularly, is there was a thought process, there was a way of processing the situation, certain thoughts that began to compound, and eventually it felt like this experience of an attack. And so we must take personal responsibility for our thoughts, for our emotions, through the provision that God has provided. All right, secondly, before we get to the practical steps here in Philippians chapter 4, to navigate with the gospel successfully the anxiety God has allowed in our lives. Number two, so we must appreciate the human experience. Number two, we have to remember the heavenly perspective. How does God view anxiety? What is the lens through which he processes it? Uh, If you've heard of a guy named Elon Musk, have you heard of this guy? He's slightly influential and resourced in our day. Um, This quote he he posted just after the um, Gaza-Israel incident. You can see the timestamp there, October 7th of last year. Do you see the yearning in his voice? Sorry to see what's happening in Israel. I hope there can be peace one day. And Elon Musk, if you watch this man with all of his resources and all of his smarts and all of his genius, it almost feels like he's sending rockets all over the cosmos trying to find this elusive peace. You do know today that there's a peace that only heaven provides. There's a peace you'll never find on planet earth. If it's moored, if it's anchored, if it's looking exclusively to this life and to this world, it's a peace that transcends. So how do we access that peace? We've got to see anxiety through the perspective that God provides for us. Go back to Genesis for just a moment. Hold your place there in Philippians. And I want to go back to the beginning of this thing called anxiety and see it in its original context, where this came from, so that we might view it through the lens of God's Word. So we're going to go back for a moment to the first garden, all right, the Garden of Eden, where God created man, put him in the garden, because if we're going to understand mood disorder, we have to first understand how it was ordered. How did God intend our tendency to be anxious, what was it supposed to be? One thing that's helped me with understanding our emotions as just a believer, as a counselor, as a pastor, as a dad, a husband, is that every mood we have had a redeemed version. What did God intend our tendency to be anxious? What was it supposed to be before the fall? Well, look here in Genesis 2 verse 15, and the Lord God took the man, put him into the garden of Eden, notice this, to dress it, and to keep it. Genesis 2.15, and to keep it. And so here we find a word which means to guard or to keep vigil. Anxiety before the fall was intended by God for us to be vigilant, to be someone who's watching for and protecting and defending that which God has entrusted to us. And so it was originally intended before the fall to be Vigilance. Go to chapter 3 quickly and look at verse 10. All right, again, for sake of time, we'll not read it, but you have the fall. Eve takes of the fruit that's forbidden. Adam follows suit. Notice now verse 10, as they're hiding and God is seeking them in the garden. And he, Adam, said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was, what's the next word? Afraid. The first thing to show up after the fall is fear. The first thing to show up after the fall is anxiety. And the man that God had created to be a guard in a century now is hiding in the undergrowth from God in a condition of fear. And so we see mood order, we see mood disorder. Now what about the second garden? Remember there's a second garden. Aren't you thankful for that? Where the second Adam came to planet earth and he followed the will of the father. He aligned himself with the purpose of God And if you look at Jesus compared to the disciples, the disciples are fight and flight, right? Peter swings the sword, and then I know not the man. Jesus, in contrast, there's not any anxiety in his heart as he stands, as he faithfully goes forward for the Lord, this mood reorder that God has provided. And then there's the final part of the story, and that is someday in heaven we're free of all of this, right? 
There won't be one more anxious thought or moment. There will not be one more fearful downturn of our emotions. All of that is ours through the gospel of Jesus. One author put it this way, a common source of anxiety is relationships with ambiguity, not knowing where you stand with someone. What an underappreciated source of peace that we never have to wonder where we stand with Jesus, right? That's only possible that we know where we stand with Jesus because of the gospel. So that's the backstory. Let's go back now to Philippians 4 and let's look at three practical steps we can take with number two, the answer of the divine gospel. So the anatomy of um, human anxiety, now the answer of divine gospel. Um, you're, you guys, your weather, I, I'm not jealous, okay, too much for you, okay? I live in Ohio, and um, I was talking about seasonal affective disorder yesterday. I mean, we, it's dark, it's cold, it's miserable in Ohio. Um, we may have snow in May of this year. We don't know. We didn't have much snow this winter, so who knows? Um, but it's interesting to me how much we live inside spaces instead of going out into the glorious outdoors that God has given. World Health Organization said this just the other day, study came out, the average American spends 93% of their lives indoors, in a car, in a, does this make you want to just go for a hike this afternoon, just to, even in the rain, just defy this statistic? Some of you moms, you hide in a closet from your young kids, okay, whatever, I don't know, wherever you spend your life indoors, but isn't it interesting how we get stuck in where we live, right? The gospel gives us a, a view of anxiety that's outside of where we live. We need a perspective outside of ourselves. Um, one author put it this way, the goal of preaching is to take people away from themselves as the instruments of healing. My goal today is to convince you that where you live and what you see is not enough. If you don't know Jesus Christ as Savior, you need a perspective outside of where you live today. If you are saved and you're battling fear and anxiety, you need something outside of you to help you contextualize the things that you're navigating. All right, so in the time we have left, let's look at three steps here in Philippians 4 that help us avail ourselves of the gospel to deal with the fear and anxiety that constantly is a part of our world. Here's the first step. Jot this down. Commit to God-given relationships. The first step we take toward the gospel and away from our fears is we choose to commit anew and afresh to God-given relationships. There's, first of all, the vertical component of this. Go back, if you will, to verse 5 the verse that proceeds where your pastor read a moment ago, let your moderation be known unto all men. We'll come back to that. Notice the end of the verse, the Lord is at hand. The idea is the Lord is near enough I can reach out and handle him or touch him. He's close to me. The Lord is near. Go down to the end of verse 9. So do all these things that we'll come back to in just a moment, and the God of peace shall be with you. Isn't that interesting, the end of verse 9, that he does not say the peace of God will be with you? He says the God of peace will be with you. And so we find answers for our anxiety. Listen, first of all, in relationship with God, right? The, the person who knows no fear and knows no anxiety uh, in the present tense, he offers us to have relationship with him. Here's what I've noticed. When I'm fearful and anxious, it tends to skew or blur my view of God. I tend to resent him or not view him accurately, and so I need to lean into him when I'm most tempted to lean away from him. There's never been an anxious moment that you've lived in that God is not there. He, he is near you this morning. He's near you tomorrow. He's near the moment you most fear and dread this next week or the one you don't even know that you're going to navigate this week. He is there. He is near you. Lean into that relationship through the gospel of Jesus. A friend of mine put it this way, those who run to Jesus get better. Those who run away from Jesus get worse. Run, run, run to Jesus. And so we've got to move toward God when we fear and we're anxious, not a retreat or run away from him. All right, go back to verse 2. He speaks to these two gals. Iodius and Sintichi says that they be of the same mind. Go to verse 5. Let your moderation or your gentleness be known unto all men. So first of all, relationship vertically with God. Secondly, we must be in relationship with other believers. 
It's when we're in Christian community that we're dealing with our anxiety. Um, I wish you could meet my wife. She's not able to be with me today um, or this weekend, but um, she teaches fourth grade, and we have, um, she's got quite a few things going back in Ohio, or she doesn't want to be with me. I don't know, one of the two. And um, my wife is obsessed with these little men who have like a long goatee, and you never can see their eyes, and they got these nubby noses. You know what I'm talking about? Gnomes, right? She is obsessed with them. They're everywhere. Um, a few months ago, this was early on a Sunday morning, I walked into our kitchen, and I was getting ready to wash my hands. I had made coffee. I was going to wash my hands. And as my hand touched the dispenser, I realized my hand was on top of the head of a gnome. Even the soap dispenser is a gnome. And so here's my thinking. For me to keep the attention of my wife as I age, I feel like I probably ought to move toward the style of being a, a gnome if I want to keep her attention, all right? Isn't it funny how when you're around someone, you start liking what they like, right? You start loathing what they loathe, or at least, you know, I have no choice in this with the gnome thing. I live with gnomes every day of my life, okay? Um, it, it, it affects us, right? Same is true with fear. Being with other believers causes us to view fear through more, hopefully, the lens of the gospel than the lens of our flesh and our circumstances and the challenges that, that constantly plague us. And so we must be in right relationship with God's people. What we're doing today, we're saying we refuse to be fearful. Worshiping together, fellowshipping together, studying God's word, we choose together to team up against that anxiety and that fear. Research says that more than three in five Americans report being chronically lonely, and that number is on the rise. Interesting, with that same trend, Anxiety, depression, suicidal thoughts are also on the rise. Listen to this, this statement. Scientists now warn that loneliness is worse for our health than obesity, smoking, lack of access to health care, and physical inactivity. Loneliness is lethal. It may not kill you literally, but it'll begin to kill your soul. It'll begin to kill your hope. It'll begin to kill the vision that God wants you to have through the lens of the gospel. Being antisocial, I'm an introvert, so I get it, okay? Being antisocial feeds the anxiety. And the way to push back against that fear and to push back against that anxiety is to lean into Christian community. So number one, we commit to God-given relationships. Number two, meditate on Christ-honoring thoughts. So first, we commit to God-given relationships. Number two, we meditate on Christ-honoring thoughts. Um, one of the key aspects of our fear is that fear and anxiety is fed by thought processes. And so we need to guard against our thoughts being affected by, tainted by, um, the wrong kind of thinking, and instead let what God provides for us guide our thoughts. So I give you two categories of thoughts that we've got to work at to fight against fear with the gospel. Number one, thoughts of prayer. Go back to verse 6 that we began with this morning. Be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. Here's the antidote Paul provides based upon the foundation of the gospel. He tells these believers to pray. He uses four different iterations of prayer, and he encourages them not to be anxious, but instead to pray. Um, I have kind of an odd way of thinking, um, probably to some of you, but I often ask these like hypothetical questions, and here's the question that I, I've wrestled with for years. Why do we tell God something in prayer that he already knows? You ever struggle with that? I've had this thought probably since I was in middle school. Why are we telling God about something that you just said he already knows about it? And here's the thought that I think we see clearly in the text here. If you look at verse 6, the end of the verse, prayer, listen, is us getting to know that God knows. Did you notice that at the end of verse 6? Let your requests be made known unto God. I'm not informing God. I'm informing my emotions. I'm informing my thoughts that God now has heard from me. He knows what's on my heart and mind that I'm most fearful of through the avenue of prayer. Verse 7 And the peace, this peace that now floods our soul of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. 
Paul does not say here anything circumstantially changes. All he says in the midst of it, now there's someone guarding or keeping. Did you notice the end of verse 7? It says, through Christ Jesus. Um, I don't know how you end your prayers. I end my prayers with in Jesus' name, in Christ's name, something to that effect. Um, When we pray to God about our fears, now not the first Adam who did not keep the garden, who failed. We have the second Adam, listen, who never fails us. That's the gospel. He keeps us. He guards us. I'm free now just to be what he wants me to be because he's looking out for me. And so prayer avails us, thoughts of prayer, to his protection and his provision. Look at verse 8. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things. Now this list that we're so familiar with, things that are true, honest, just, pure, lovely, of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise. Notice these last four words. Think on these things. Number two, thoughts of worthiness. Thoughts of prayer. Number two, thoughts of worthiness. If you compare this verse to Psalm 19, it's a direct parallel to the psalm that describes the word of God. Where do we find worthy thoughts like described here in the text? We find them in the word of God. Prayer, the word. Making sure our thoughts are uh, aligned with God's word. Um, Sometimes we try to starve our fear. And I heard an author just recently say this. It's so profound. He said, instead of trying to starve my fears, I'm trying to drown my fears. Drown your anxiety with thoughts of prayer. Drown your anxiety with thoughts of Scripture, thoughts of worthiness. All right, lastly, number three, we must engage in spirit-applied actions. So we commit to God-given relationships, deal with anxiety with the gospel. We meditate on Christ-honoring thoughts. Thirdly, we engage in spirit-applied actions. Before we show the next slide, here was the caption, and then I'll show you the picture Here's the caption. The doctor asked me to spend at least one hour per day on the treadmill, and then here was the picture. Okay, I mean, technically, isn't he complying? I mean, he's doing what the doctor said, or at least he's in the spot that the doctor told him to be. Can I say to you today, listen, anxiety feeds on inactivity. Fear immobilizes us. And one of the best ways that we can deal with fear and battle fear is to actually move toward the fear, to move into the actions that God has called us to. Go to verse 9. He says, those things which you have both learned and received and heard and seen in me, do. So we are called first to have actions that are selfless. And he goes on in verse 10 to talk about you've ministered to my needs. So actions that are selfless. When are you healed from anxiety? Not when you don't fear, feel fearful, but when you even do fear, fear, uh, feel fearful and you still serve those that God has put in your life. Actions that are selfless. Verse 13, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Actions that are confident. So when we trust in God and in the gospel, we can do everything that God has called us to do. All right, the next slide is a recommended resource. There's several in this series, 31-day devotionals, but this is, I found this to be most helpful for counselees with anxiety um, because sometimes we just read one little pamphlet or book. This is a 31-day devotional, um, Anxiety, Knowing God's Peace. Would highly encourage you to pick that up, maybe of help to you or those that you serve. I have two sons, and uh, one is a freshman in college, the other is a junior And when I look to the future, not just the election coming this fall, but everything that's ahead of us, I I tend to be a bit anxious. Do you? I don't like the trend lines. I don't like, even in me, some of the things that I feel like are, are moving in a certain direction. And I'm thankful that the gospel gives us hope beyond what we see in our present circumstances. Somebody put it this way, our anxiety comes not from thinking about the future, but wanting to control it, right? It's not that just thinking about the future is what feeds our anxiety. It's the fact we want to we want to direct it, we want to steer it, we want to redirect it, and it feeds um, this anxiety in our souls. Um, do you know that only one person can both handle knowing the future and controlling the future, and he's already taken responsibility for that? And who is that? That is our God, the same God that gave us Jesus, His Son, to give us the gospel. And so it's a matter of reliance, it's a matter of resting, it's a matter of trusting in this God. Um, 
I was in Israel a couple of years ago, and we were on the Mount of Olives looking toward um, the old city, and I'll show these couple of slides here. This first picture is the eastern gate from, from the valley, kind of looking up to the old city. The second picture is from the inside of this same gate, um, a place that only Muslims could go down in and pray. You can see some of their shoes and rugs there. Um, but this is the eastern gate. And Brother Skelly that was leading our trip, he said to us, he said, ladies and men, he said, someday you're going to remember when you were here, here were his words, the first time. What's so significant about the eastern gate? Who's blowing through this gate? Jesus, right? The Jesus of the gospel. And listen, who's with him? You and me. You know how many of us in that moment, I, I have not ridden horse as much, but I, I hear maybe we're going to do that with this little entrance we're going to do. As we're bobbing up and down on the horses and we make eye contact with each other, you know one of the things I'm going to most regret? How many things I fear that are eclipsed by the promises of this moment? Promises that I only have the right to claim and live in light of because of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Listen, listen, and we're done. The gospel gives us the good news, everything we need. It's robust enough not just to save our soul from condemnation and hell someday, but to save us from this anxiety that constantly is a part of our life. Today's St. Patty's Day. Sorry, I'm not wearing green. You can pinch me afterwards if you want, okay? We'll chase each other around that don't have green on. Patrick uh, was quoted as saying this, Christ with me, Christ before me, Christ behind me, Christ in me, Christ over me. It's all Christ. And it's only because of the gospel. Why would we fear when we have such a glorious gospel?